Hello. As it turns out, misinformation is being spread on TikTok. Can you believe it? Let's talk about one important example of that. I feel great. I feel really good. It's breakfast with priest attacks. Sex in the garage. This is what your family goes through. Your friends and your the concept of intrusive thoughts and phrases using that phrase has become pretty popular on social media platforms, especially TikTok, but also on Twitter, I guess like YouTube and stuff as well. This is a phrase that describes a genuine sensation, a genuine situation that happens with people, oftentimes with people with mental health conditions, and it affects them the most. However, a lot of TikToks and a lot of comments are using it the wrong way. One of the most popular phrases you hear with it now is that the intrusive thoughts won. And this is often a phrase used uh, referring to impulsive behavior like cutting your hair late at night or barking in class. Every day, it's a battle with my intrusive thoughts and they won today inside class. <laughs> in reality, however, intrusive thoughts are not the same as impulsive thoughts. Intrusive thoughts is a term describing unwanted, unpleasant thoughts that occur despite your desires and oftentimes despite your conscience. They essentially intrude on your behavior, on your way of being, on your day. Impulses are different because they reflect sudden urges or wishes. Anyone can experience both, but one is describing something that can be a genuinely perturbing situation, especially, as I said before, for people with mental health conditions. So let's explain. I'm a person who, as you may have seen in my last video, has undiagnosed ADHD, meaning I'm pretty sure I have it, but I can't afford to pay for a diagnosis. And I've experienced a bunch of both. I've experienced a lot of difficult, intrusive thoughts. An example of that would be, I used to do theater in college, and I would often in the middle of a play, like right on stage with the audience there, to have these intrusive thoughts that would say like, what would happen if I, I, I just decided not to say my line? What would happen if I decided to pull my pants down on stage and disturb everybody and scar everybody forever? Oh my God, I have so much power over these people. I could do all types of horrible things and nobody would be able to say anything and they would all have to witness it on stage and it would alter their ability to experience theater forever. Intrusive thoughts can also be way more serious. They can be thoughts about committing violence, about doing horrible things. And the whole point is that they run contrary to your desires, to your conscience. They're not things that you want to do. They're not things you have urges about, but they pop up and then you get really disturbed by them oftentimes because it's like, where's this thought coming from? What do I do about it? And that makes them very different from impulsive thoughts or impulses because those come from urges. For instance, you randomly want to cut your hair all of a sudden, but that's a want. And it's a type of desire, it's a type of urge that maybe runs contrary to your other urges and maybe isn't such a great thing to act on in a situation, but it's a desire. Sometimes you even act on those impulses, which is where the intrusive thoughts one phrase comes from. And that's a revelation that they're not intrusive thoughts. There is no desire in a person when they have an intrusive thought about committing an act of violence to actually commit an act of violence. It's actually the opposite. It's that fear. It's that anxiety that that is a thing that could happen potentially and that it's so opposite to what you actually want. They're not the kind of thoughts that you have and think this is something that I am interested in seeing. You don't, when you have those kind of thoughts, you don't speak about them. Yeah. I thought I'd committed some horrendous act of thought crime just by having had that thought. So it was immediately something which felt unacceptable and alien to me and very frightening. So right from the very start, it was something that I was absolutely not prepared to talk about. Everything that I did for 11 and a half years was underscored by this constant voice, constant doubt, constant uh, rapid fire mental images. The only way I can kind of describe that terror is it felt like I'd killed someone and I had a body in the back garden. That's what it felt like. That was the kind of terror that oh my God, I've done something horrendous. I've so thought something so terrible. I've committed an unforgivable sin and my life is never gonna be the same again. That was the terror. It was, it was, it was, it was doom really, it was nightmarish. This creates a debilitating cycle for people with conditions like ADHD or OCD, which it's most commonly associated with, particularly like in social discourse. I'm so OCD, I let the intrusive thoughts win. And then when people talk about actual intrusive thoughts about stuff like 
pedophilia or racism or like assaulting someone, suddenly everyone's like, that's not OCD. And that's my issue with people using the phrase, my intrusive thoughts one, because then suddenly everyone thinks that intrusive thoughts are like these weird suppressed hidden desires and beliefs that you have, which can get very dangerous because then when people talk about things like pedophilia, then suddenly people have this idea, oh, if intrusive thoughts are sort of like, mm, I wanna cut my hair at like three in the morning and it's like this desire that I have, but I'm gonna like suppress it. Or sometimes the intrusive thought is gonna win, which is kind of like an oxymoron because intrusive means unwanted. Like you don't want the thoughts to win. Now suddenly everyone thinks that these people who have intrusive thoughts about harming people are like dangerous criminals. When in reality, those are the people that are least likely to cause harm. I literally saw a video of this guy the other day and he was like, sometimes when I'm even just walking down the street and I just like smile at a kid, my OCD is like, why'd you do that are you a pedophile like clearly the thoughts are so illogical and they're so distressing because it's people's biggest fears and that's why it's called ocd because you do so many compulsions and you get stuck in the cycle literally 24 7 like it's actually debilitating and it's really messed up when people are like i have intrusive thoughts about harming people and then you automatically think they're a bad person the amount of people who have like harm ocd or pocd or like be OCD, anything about like harming people. The amount of people who literally, they will lock themselves in their house, in their rooms, because they were so scared of causing harm to people. Not to mention the amount of people who die by suicide because maybe they don't even know that they have OCD or the intrusive thoughts are just like so overwhelming. Or like moms who have postpartum OCD, because Lord knows no one's teaching those things. And they literally don't even want to take care of their own baby. Like they can't be in a room alone with their own baby. Or people who like don't want to date their partner anymore or who quit their jobs because these thoughts are so debilitating. The intrusive thoughts one was kind of funny in the beginning, but now people have just completely lost all meaning. Like as if OCD isn't misrepresented enough already. Like now people are even more confused about what it is. The clip you just saw is from the TikTok channel Made of Millions, which is a nonprofit that does support groups and advocacy work. And it's put out multiple videos about this bastardization of the term intrusive thoughts. And they're not the only ones. There are actually many TikToks that either in an effort to combat misinformation or just naturally are addressing intrusive thoughts in a correct way. Sometimes they're comedic, sometimes they're educational, but there's tons of TikTok content that's not misappropriating the term. And yet there's a problem that persists, right? There's a problem that we can see wherein the most common usage, it seems, nowadays is a completely wrong usage that ultimately alters a term that's very necessary for people, particularly very necessary for people who suffer from those experiences and need the terminology to be able to articulate it. So why is this happening and what can we do to stop it? Let's talk about it after the ad break. Thank you for watching the ad, it helps the channel. In our last video, I discussed a conversation that's happening about misinformation on social media, about mental health, about mental health conditions. And I had a particular stance that some people like and some people don't, where I think people are stigmatizing self-diagnosis online and mental health conversations online among people with all types of potential symptoms or potential non-symptoms, assuming that there's some sort of race for clout, that it's a trend, that people are commodifying mental health and mental conditions in order to gain some sort of favor. And I think this is generally not true. I don't think that most people online saying they may have ADHD are doing it because they just don't care, they're flippant, and they want some sort of attention or they want to feel like they have a disorder of some sort. I don't think that that's really the case. And I get that some people disagree because there are some instances where that happens, but I don't think those reflect the majority at all. And I don't think that the idea of that happening should be used as a stigmatization for all of that engagement. I think there's way too much energy and attention put into it. But that being said, I completely understand where that concern comes from because as this video is kind of pointing out, there's a severe problem with misinformation online. It's a thing. It's been happening in all types of ways for many years. Shannon, that's my water. Oh dear Lord. That's not your water. I know. Where indeed. <laughs> and in particular, we see that people with mental health conditions are being negatively affected by stigmas and social ideas about their conditions, about mental health being passed around online carelessly. So I get it. I get that. 
And what I kind of wanted to do with this video is address an example of that to discuss how it happens and what we can do about it and where I think that diverges from having a type of resentment and a type of rhetoric that is against this perceived idea of kids chasing mental illness for clout. Now, one of the simplest yet biggest steps we can do is generally bringing a platform to people who have experienced these conditions, who know about it, and allowing them to speak on their experiences while passing on good information. This is generally something that we know we should do, and yet it has to be repeated every time because sometimes we don't have sight of that. We lose sight of the seriousness of these conversations. At the same time, I do think there's a bigger issue and there are bigger solutions that have to come. I don't think it's sufficient to just say, correct the misinformation and platform people from marginalized groups because for one, it's not really ultimately the responsibility of people to put good information out constantly when at the end of the day, people are choosing to ignore oftentimes large amounts of information that are easily accessible online and instead just hop with trendy usages of terms and misinformation as soon as it comes to them because it works with their interests, it works with their narratives or whatever. Ever. No amount of educational content, no great big video is going to fix that. And number two, as Olufemi Taiwo talks about in his book Elite Capture, oftentimes platforming marginalized voices becomes platforming the most favored voices of a marginalized group in order to have them have a sort of authority over that entire group and the information that is important about them, as well as to have them put out the information in a way that's cushy with the people who have power over them. In other words, representation isn't enough. And just yelling at TikTok kids is also not a great idea. We should ask why people are so easily convinced by misinformation and so easily motivated to use and spread words without taking time to learn what they mean. And that's not an easy question to answer. There are a lot of different cultures and linguistic phenomena that alone have their own approach to how information is disseminated and how to approach words and phrases. It's very popular human behavior, for example, to see a word, and have it change over time depending on which group is using the word and how situations change. That's basically how language works. There's no way to make a term mean something, one particular thing for the rest of time. As societies change and seek new vocabulary to express their experiences and observations, words are invented and reinvented. And what happens is we have this picture of the society as if it's like one organism. But in actuality, we know history is defined by the victors, right? And so what we understand of societies is oftentimes colored by the most successful and powerful people in those societies who then have that sort of dictation of what is true for that society. And that's the elite capture thing again. In this case, you have misinformation being spread about a mental health term that is being spread by people who oftentimes don't have that mental health condition, who don't have these experiences with intrusive thoughts at that level and don't understand what it's like to have OCD. And so for them, they have this type of power in that situation to be more represented and to be more accepted. And so their word and their ideas are gonna be taken more seriously. So in the case of a phrase like intrusive thoughts, because it has a key medical meaning that is useful for the struggles of a group of people that are disadvantaged in our society, I think it's important we try to push back on such a phrase being redefined by those who are in more powerful positions or who don't understand that key importance and question whether also other popular phrases like saying, I'm so OCD, oh, I'm so OCD right now, <laughs> are actually really negatively affecting the people who have OCD. The thing is, we also have to remember that there's a reason why certain people have more power than others. Not to get super Foucauldian, I'm not a big Foucault guy, but yes, people have different marginalized statuses and normative statuses, and people who are more normative are more closely related to power and are more able to gain more power for themselves as individual actors. And those things are based on systems. Sorry to say it, systems create norms that are the reasons why certain people are the norm and certain people aren't. And that makes it so it's very difficult for people who aren't the norm to have a voice. So my, I do recognize misinformation is important to tackle. 
But the reason we have power struggles over terminology on social media, from people who are not represented, from people who are politically disadvantaged, is because they have such little power, it feels, over the material things that are causing their disadvantages, that are key to their disadvantages, that they can only really battle in these cultural realms like what's being said on TikTok. And so my goal is that even if I'm going to point out misinformation, I'm also going to have to remind you that situations are only going to get worse if we don't start making real efforts to make sure those people gain power, meaning that their disadvantages no longer exist. To the best of our ability, we have to try to create that. And that includes doing things like mutual aid efforts, as well as spreading knowledge of different resources. I have two that I'll talk to you about real quick. The first is the aforementioned Made of Millions nonprofit. Check out their support groups and their events and consider donating to them if you think they check out. And the second is called Open Path Collective. They offer services in the U.S. for affordable counseling. Psychotherapists who work with them are given some benefits from the company who raises money through a flat fee that they charge for entrance. And then they are paid by the clients, giving them much more discounted rates than they would usually charge to make sure that they can help people who have financial struggles, including those who are uninsured, like myself. So if you're in the US and you're looking for therapy or you know some people who are looking for therapy, maybe check it out. Unfortunately, my resources are limited to the US because this is where I live, this is what I know. But if you're from a different country and there's resources in your country that can help people with mental health conditions, with mental health struggles, then feel free to share them in the comments section. Ultimately, terminology is important, but winning TikTok terminology battles is not going to be nearly enough to help the people who are disadvantaged, to help the people who need help, including in this case, people with mental health conditions. We have to build that power by finding it, growing it, and spreading it to those who need it. So yeah, that's it. Thanks for watching. Short video today. Just wanted to address a phrase that so many of you guys are saying wrong. <laughs> Feel free to leave a comment on anything, like if you like it, subscribe, send me a ko-fi if you feel so inclined, and stay tuned for future endeavors. I don't know why I'm talking like this. Sometimes have intrusive thoughts about it because, wow, that's a, that's a new alarm. This is a different alarm. This is a different vibe of alarm. What is that? What is that siren?